space as I continued on over the years. That's an amazing, it is amazing how much we still don't know, but then you were coming into the scholarly world at a time when it were really just beginning to rethink the role of Native people in the- Exactly, that's, that's very true. Uh, let me perhaps put it this way. Um, let's go all the way back to the 1890s and talk about Frederick Jackson Turner. Uh, his essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, major piece influencing scholarship for many, many years. And it really, it's the story can be des described this way. Turner is concerned that the frontier is disappearing uh, right. in the United States. That's, that's what he's worried about. Uh, what are we going to do when the frontier is gone? But in the process, he, he sort of has these images, uh, and, and they can be uh, perhaps summarized this way. And that is, there is a dividing line out there between savagery and civilization. And I'll let everyone who's listening decide or watch yeah. who were the savages and that's who right. were the good people. The and, civilized and side, Frederick Jackson Turner was civilized. on. Well, that's kind of the state of where things were. There was a yeah. famous textbook that was used widely in uh, college courses in the 1930s and before, maybe even after, uh, by uh, uh, the Beards. Uh, and and uh, this particular textbook, uh, uh, I guess, can best be described if you read the passages about the Indians in colonial America. Their main occupation was getting ready to scalp, and they were sulking in the woods. Right. They really weren't real people, mm -hmm. but they were out there, and they were threatening the advance of white civilization. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you just one more example, uh, which is, I guess, one of my favorite stories. Now, there's a book that comes out in the 1930s called Comes Along the Mohawk by Walter yeah, Edmund. Yeah. And it's long, and there are very few good Indians in it. There are a lot of settlers where the right. Indians apparently are hassling them all through the Mohawk frontier um, without ever saying maybe that property actually originally and still belonged to the Indians, that sort of thing. Yeah. They made a movie in 1939, yeah. and... Uh, it's uh, called Drums Along the Mohawk, yeah. and the Fonda stars in it. Yeah, uh, he goes to West. I'm sorry? It's a classic movie. It's a classic. Yeah. I'm not recommending it, but it's still a classic. Yeah. <laughs> and again, it's good white yeah. versus bad Indians. Sure, the Indians yeah. will be skulking in the woods, getting ready to burn people out, destroy yeah. their property, uh, uh, try to uh, obviously kill and collect scalps, so all that right. sort of imagery that's out there. Mm -hmm. But the, the point about this is, is that it's where it was. That was what was being taught. The movie fit right in. Um, there, there's a, a scene where uh, Gil Martin's uh, wife um, confronts an Indian by the name of Blueback, and she becomes hysterical. She's oh, facing yeah. the savage, and it's yes. almost laughable when we watch it today, and it takes her actually weeks and weeks and months and months to recover from this terrible experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's all going to get obviously switched around. Um, and uh, that was one of the things that I was very interested mm -hmm. in. Uh, when Joe Gladhar, uh, my co-author on the uh, uh, Forgotten Allies book, approached me about getting involved in this project in, in the 1990s, mm -hmm. uh, pointing toward uh, a 2006 publication, um, I was aware there was a different story there, and Joe mm -hmm. had begun to do some research, and I joined, I joined him in that project. We worked together for a while and uh, did various, uh, various combinations, got everything finished up. But what we came out with was an entirely different story. I really? mean, it's, it's just the absolute opposite of what you would see in Trumps Along the Mohawk if you uh, cared to watch that movie today. And so that's all part. That's all part of the important story here. There's been like this 180 degree turn away from this notion: the Indians are the savages, the whites are the good guys, uh, and it sort of becomes, in the words of historian, late historian Francis Jennings, the invasion of America by the whites who attack the Indians and steal their property. So we flip the story, uh, and maybe in the process of flipping it we maybe have gone a little bit too far because one of the points that I would make along this line is that in the process, we really haven't spent very much time learning about the Indians themselves, the actual characters, the people who are involved in these stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the things that I've been very interested in. Uh, we try to bring that out uh, in the Forgotten Allies book and 
uh, and some of the more recent work that I've been doing. Interesting. We're talking with James Kirby Martin from, uh, about his work on the Forgotten Allies, the United Indians, and the American Revolution. I wonder if we could just go back a little bit then and talk about who were the Oneidas and the Haudenosaunee and what their world was like before the arrival of the Right. Uh, and let's, let's uh, think pre-contact, pre-Columbus. The Oneidas were part of an group of Iroquois Indians focused primarily in uh, the modern state of New York. Obviously, it wasn't modern then. Uh, it was a, a wilderness area. And they're really uh, in the, uh, let's say, 14th, 15th, into the 16th centuries. There are five nations moving. Uh, you have the Mohawks in the east. Think of modern day Albany over to Schenectady. Next over, uh, not quite to Syracuse, more in the Utica area. Uh, would be our friends, the Oneidas. Then you go to the center, and that is in the Syracuse area and a little bit beyond the Onondaga Indians. Then you get the Cayugas in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Finger Lakes area. And finally, as you go all the way uh, west toward Albany, uh, you have the Seneca Nation. So there are five of them. And amazingly enough, they are spending a lot of time fighting among themselves in the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. They're not getting along. They are not a coordinated or a confederated nation at this point in time. But the story in the, in the, in the legend, but it's more than a legend, there's some accuracy to it, uh, is that an Indian, apparently an Onondaga, rose up. Dagani Wida was his name. Now, I don't know whether I'm saying that correctly or not because uh, my pronunciation of certain uh, Native American Indian words is not all that good. But anyway, that's accepted. The Ganawita rode up and rose up. And what he did, he, he tried to go out and convince these five nations that they would stop fighting amongst themselves. But the problem he has is he's an ugly creature. He's hard to look at. He's deformed. So he will make an association with the much more famous Hiawatha. Hiawatha will become the messenger. He will go out and do the work. And out of this is going to emerge uh, what we call the Five Nations League of Peace and Power. Rule one, we get along. Rule two, we stop killing each other. Rule th three, we respect everyone's territory, but we will have an overview government based on a grand council, which will be... Uh, organized a meeting in the Syracuse, what would be the Syracuse, New York area. So that is that is the picture. This is very, very important because this is the beginning of the Confederacy. And so the, the effect of this is one, these once fighting five nations, and by the way, the Tuscaroras will join them in the early uh, 17th century, around 1715, 1720, so they become six nations, and the uh, Tuscaroras sort of live on and maintain their location in United Territory. But anyway, that's the five nations. Now they're not fighting. Now they have tremendous strength because they are now organized to deal with enemies which are coming and attacking them, like the Hurons from Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the beginning of building great strength so that when contact begins to happen, they are prepared to defend themselves and their territory with some success, I guess yeah. I should say. But that's, that's the, the, the two, the pre-contact period right there is yeah. this amazing organization. Yeah. Now, it's a, now, in the last 40, 50 years, an argument has arisen that this was somehow a progenitor for the Americans' idea of uniting. And uh, yes. I wonder if you want to weigh in on that. Yes, I can. Uh, that that is, has been a vigorous debate whether the organizing of the League of Peace and Power, which we can translate and start using the word uh, the uh, Six Nations Confederacy, uh, is that that concept of confederation did play a very, very important part uh, in our own uh, articles of confederation. And that has been debated very extensively, and there are two sides. Um, and I'm not going to come out in favor of either side. Let me leave okay. it that way. I've, I've been asked uh, to look into that issue, uh, but 
really, it's been very, very difficult with, with other commitments I've had to sure. get into that topic. But it's a very important topic. What is the relationship? But let me broaden that a little bit. Let's go back to the theme of savages. Mm -hmm. Really? Were these folks, let me give you a couple of, they had very sophisticated government from local mm -hmm. to the grand council level. Mm -hmm. That is not unsophisticated. Right. They're mat matrilineal in organization. The respect for women mm -hmm. is incredible when you compare it to the way women were being treated in European society. Right. And so these are the kinds of things you start to wonder, you know, and I'm not going to push this one way or that. Who are the real savages here? Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's that's one of the issues. And and uh, I do believe that uh, my friends uh, in the United Nation believe strongly that role that is of the Confederacy, that is the uh, overall uh, Confederacy of the Six Nations Confederacy, did play a role in the thinking of Benjamin Franklin and others. Uh, and when they began to conceptualize the notion of the Confederacy of the 13 states. Uh, the question has not been settled one way or the other. I would say right now, general academic opinion is probably not much of a connection but that's yet to be fully determined. Right. And one thing it does illustrate is how much, though, people like Franklin were thinking about the Native people in the 1700s. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and that is that is a uh, characteristic. One of the things that we, we, we need to get over, I believe, when we deal with uh, Native American or Indigenous history is this notion that one side... All the Indians are one side and all the European whites are on the other side. That is really incorrect. Yeah. Uh, I'll, get, I'll give you an example. A uh, historian I know pretty well by the name of David Preston wrote a book uh, called The Texture of Contact. And it deals with the inner relationships between whites and Indians that are settling in the Mohawk Valley over a lengthy period of time, that's to say most of the 18th century, and primarily in some areas, they get along very well. Uh, and it isn't, it isn't a matter of always sort of hatchet versus, you know, the musket kind of thing, yeah. or musket versus musket, however you want to say it. But actually, there is some harmony there, and that will play into the way things are going to fall out during the American Revolution, is right. in fact, where not all the Indians... Mm -hmm. And on one side, the whites on the other side. Right. So uh, that's that's important to keep that in mind. It is. And then there are characters like William Johnson, Joseph Brandt, Molly Brandt, who were right. part of this uh, creating this harmony. Or right. I think uh, Sir William Johnson is an amazing character. He comes over uh, representing uh, another individual to sort of allegedly manage his lands, but he becomes this amazing cultural broker and develops very, very close relations with the Mohawk Nation. And they they treat him really, I, I don't know, almost like a prince. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, he is going to end up with lots and lots of land, 100,000 or more acres that the, uh, the, the uh, Mohawks will turn over to him. Uh, he will claim uh, Molly Brandt, Joseph Brandt's uh, uh, we haven't talked about him yet, but but uh, his his sister Molly, uh, and uh, they will have a long time relationship, and I guess we could politely say informal marriage. She will bear children by Sir William, and the, and the bottom line is, without going into all the additional detail, he has a very close working relationship and is the chief white cultural broker to the Senecas. I'm sorry, not to someone I say the Senecas. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I, met, I met the Mohawks. Yeah. Uh, we're still we're still way back east. Right. Uh, but I just wanted I think it's it's again it's important to understand that these interactions are taking place and they do have a historical impact uh, over time. Yes. But yeah. that's one example. Um, yeah. Joseph Brandt, mm -hmm. fascinating character. One reason I've been interested in him he was apparently born in the Ohio country uh, near Cleveland, mm -hmm. near the Cuyahoga River. I believe the year is 1743. He'll live into the uh, uh, next century. Uh, mm -hmm. As I remember, he lives until around 1808 or 1810, somewhere in there. But the point, point is he becomes a major 
loyalist leader of the Mohawks and actually with very, very heavy British influences during the Revolutionary War. He's very well educated. He's like an adopted son. Uh, his, his older sister is a consort of uh, 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 Johnson, uh, and he becomes like a uh, child or a, a son, if I could use that. So Brant's an important guy. Yes. Uh, but he's not on the American side, and he's not beloved no. of the United. Let me put that no, right. no. And, and I think Sir George Romney does a portrait of him when he goes to London. And you yes, know, absolutely. And it, I guess it's very accurate. To, he, he, and he, he apparently is, is a very striking, handsome man. Uh, oh. I presume that's true. He will come back, by the way, after his sojourn in London in 1775 and into 1776, and he'll come back. And he will organize his own branch raiding party that consists both both of uh, both Indians and whites, local settlers, and they really do a good job of being one of the sources devastating uh, the uh, Indian country in the Mohawk Valley. Yeah, yeah one of those groups that appear in Drums Along the Mohawk. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. So we're we're talking with James Kirby Martin about the Oneida Nation. Actually, we're working our way toward the Oneida Nation, as we're talking generally about the formation of the Haudenosaunee League and native people in this area in the you know, period after European contact. Now, I think we should, get, you, you make this point that the creation of the League is something that is going to help the, the Haudenosaunee somewhat as they're dealing with some of the real ramifications of the European arrival, and you um, list three, the weaponry, alcohol, and disease that really devastate the native people. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that sure. part of the story. Right, so let's go into the initial contact phase. Um, probably more involving explorers than actual settlers as you move toward the year 1600. And what is going to develop is like sometimes we call it the Columbian Exchange. Mm -hmm. The Europeans are going to bring certain things with them, uh, and the native population will have certain things to share with the Indians, but mostly the side that we look at is what did the Europeans bring? Well, there are three things. Number one, they brought weaponry, all right? Muskets were one of the contributions when the first matchlock muskets were fired, let's say around 1608, 1610, something like that, on the edge of uh, uh, Five Nations, Six Nations territory, the, the Indians were very impressed. Why? They were noisy. They scared people. They were highly inaccurate. That's the best way to describe them. But it's like, oh, here's another tool that we can use not so much in taking on perhaps our enemies, although that will become very important, but also uh, in the collection of fur-bearing animals, which is what the Europeans really want. They've, they've sort of, I guess, what do you say? They've, they've, they have, they've taken, taken the, the fur-bearing animals in Europe have basically been trapped out is the way to, to describe it. So there's a huge market for these fur-bearing animals, and the musket is going to play an important part in that trade. Second, they bring... The Europeans bring alcohol, devastating effect, very devastating, down to our own time. We really don't know why. Is there some sort of genetic issue uh, in relation to Indian peoples or whatever it is? But the fire water becomes a very, very serious problem, and it's used very effectively in trade, and it's also used very effectively in getting certain Indian groups to sign unfavorable treaties that will turn land over to uh, the advancing white Europeans. So they brought those two, but the number three thing, which was the most devastating in all, uh, of, of all, uh, one historian describes it as a biological catastrophe, mm -hmm. and that is disease. Mm -hmm. You name it, the Europeans had it, and it wasn't in America. In other words, America is a disease-free free environment, and it's the measles, it's the mumps, it's the smallpox, it's the chickenpox, mm -hmm. it's diphtheria. You name it, the Europeans brought it. And the Indians do not have, have not built up the antibodies to the point where they can fight these diseases. 
And the best way for me to summarize that, if you look at the whole picture, is that, as we've learned, there weren't just two or three Indians all over the Americas in 1492 uh, or into the next century. That number was probably as population was probably as, as great in the Americas as it was in Europe, 75, 80 million people. Some historians and uh, uh, others say even greater than Sunday. That mm -hmm. population is going to begin to get wiped out, disappear, 90% by the time we move, move into the 18th century. Absolutely devastating. Uh, and mm -hmm. it gives, obviously, the Europeans a great adva advantage uh, mm -hmm. because the Indians can't stand up to the disease. Now, this is not an organized conspiracy. Yeah. One of the one of the popular terms that's thrown around today is genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the real plan to exterminate the Indians. Mm -hmm. But I'm th that wasn't. People were shocked. They yeah. were surprised. The, the, the Europeans were surprised. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Why are these people so weak? Why are they dying in front of us? Mm -hmm. But that sure opens the door. That's it the un unfortunately the catastrophic effect, and that really has a is. very devastating impact, I would say, mm -hmm. on uh, the overall story of, of native versus white European relations. Right. Now, you, you mentioned uh, David Preston's book, The Texture of Contact. I'm wondering if we could say anything about what the native people, um, what's their contribution to the Colombian exchange? I mean, did the Europeans bring these things? As well right, as right. Well, that's... Uh, that's an interesting question because there's a debate about whether there was any other kind of contribution. Uh, some people would relate, uh, I guess, social diseases that apparently okay. are prevalent above some nations that they contribute those to the Europeans uh, and the spread of uh, syphilis and related diseases over Europe sort of ties into this period. Yeah. Of I was thinking too about things like right. corn, beans, squash. That is the right. agricultural sort of thing. product. Right, agricultural products will be very important uh, as part of that exchange as well. Uh, the, 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 the three sisters, as they're called, the corn, the beans. Mm -hmm. uh, what am I leaving out here? Uh, squash. 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 Thank you. Um, <clears throat> they play a very, very important yeah. part in uh, improving the European. How do we say this? Uh, food quality, food right. supplies. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, this is this is part of the pattern as well. And the the three sisters also play a very important part in the way uh, members of the Six Nation, the various nations, would hunt. Uh, mm -hmm. It was primarily the men who did the hunting, and are most attracted to uh, the weaponry that improves their hunting patterns and sort of beginning to kill all the game. Yeah. Uh, in eastern North America, which is also a problem, which leads to further tensions. Uh, that is mm -hmm. fighting over who gets what territory and right. why, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, it's, uh, it is uh, a, a basic crop, uh, and it's very, very important in maintaining a stable su food supply. The mm -hmm. tendency was to stock up spring, summer, and fall, and just to try to survive through the winter before the next stock stock up will come. And generally speaking, that does work, but we're not talking about a super abundance of food mm -hmm. so much as a super abundance of getting ready for that dreadful period in the winter where, where hunting and growing crops is very difficult. Right, so life was lived according to the cycles of nature, that is. Uh, the time very important life. point, yeah. very different from the way we live today. Right. I'm sitting in an air-conditioned office right now it's cold outside. It's unusual for Texas today, but uh, uh, it's been up in the 80s in the last few days, and we're, what, I guess in March somewhere at this particular yes, point in time. Uh, my voice is raspy because uh, we're being pollinated this month, ah, and so okay. the allergies are affecting me. Yeah. I mean, my car's turned green in the last two weeks from all the pollen in the air yeah. as uh, spring comes upon us. Mm -hmm. and, but, the, but the but the point is, we don't think about that. No. I mean, it's going to be, as we know, hotter than you know what in Houston in the summer. That's right. In my air-conditioned office. Yeah. The winter, it gets chilly. I get, we're, we're not in tune with right. the environment. and uh, the, Like these folks, they live by it. They had to design their lives according to the environments in which they were living. 
uh, and they were pretty skilled at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, of course, in the middle of the 17th, the French and the English are at war almost constantly, and the, yes. there are various native folks who are allied with them, a part of this, and what we call the French and Indian War, of course, does involve the Iroquois League. I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about the, the how the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, or whatever we would like to call it, right. impacts this relationship, and the results of it and um, how this affects the Oneida and the other members of the Haudenosaunee Indian community. Well, um, there, are, there are a pattern of wars uh, that go on um, beginning in the 1690s, go up through 1763. Um, and the culminating war is the French and Indian or Seven Years War. It's called in Europe the Seven Years War and in America, the French and Indian War. The overall Six Nation strategy is to try to remain as neutral as they possibly can, stay out of these wars. They have a deal worked out in 1701 with the French, and that is if you don't attack us, we're not going to be attacking you. We will try to be good and faithful traitors. Not traitor, but traitor. I'm trying to make the distinction of the words. Merchants. Yeah. Merchants, thank you. Yeah. I needed that help. Yeah. <laughs> and then they also have what we call the, the Silver Chain Covenant with the with the English and the British. Mm -hmm. And that also is being refurbished all the time in various conferences. Again, let us not go to war. You stay out of our territory. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go to war with you. Uh, so on and so forth. Of course, they are moving into uh, mostly Mohawk and a little bit of Oneida yeah. territory in the 18th century. But but the the strategy is really let's let's stay out of it. Let's mm -hmm. let's just protect ourselves. Good diplomacy. Yeah. Well, then the French and Indian War, and there have been some leanings a little bit here and there, it comes along. And the English, especially through the influence of Sir William Johnson, uh, with the uh, uh, with the Mohawks, and then there's a major trading post. Uh, well, let's not get into that. It's, it gets a little comp complicated for what we're trying to say here. What happens is the tilt begins, is the way I would describe it, and that is some of the Indians, Oneidas, uh, and especially Mohawks, will join with Sir William Johnson in some of the fighting that will take place including going all the way west uh, to what is called the Fort Niagara, overlooking uh, Lake Ontario uh, and the Niagara River. And it's a very strategic point, and they will capture that fort and take it away from the French with some help. Uh, but, but it's again, it's a detailed story. Yeah. The point about it is the tilt is there. Overall, it looks better if we side with the English, and it's a good decision because what happens? The English, after taking a beating early on, are winning the war, and by 1759, they have captured Quebec. 1760, they take Montreal, and good. We can go back to right. being at peace because the French are, pro are basically eliminated from the story. So the ties now really do tilt toward the English, and that's going to influence the later story once we get into the revolution. It will. And then um, the British, they'll realize that this could be a problem in impacting their allies, the Iroquois, if more Europeans are moving into the Mohawk River Valley. Yes, they do. And this this is also a very important part of the story in setting up the uh, action of the American Revolution because the Brits are faced with uh, uh, more fighting at the end of the uh, uh, Seven Years' War, or Seven French and Indian War, I guess I should say. Uh, and uh, we have what's called Pontiac's Uprising, right. a different story that maybe yeah. well, we can go into a little bit. And that is okay. Indians uh, in the uh, Ohio country and a little bit north go to war because they don't trust the English. And we have a year, year and a half of very heavy yeah. fighting, uh, dangerous fighting. And so what to come out of this, we don't want to continue the war. Wars are expensive. Mm -hmm. The Brits have paid out a lot of money to mm -hmm. win 
uh, the French and Indian War. So they will formulate what we call the Proclamation of 1763 policy. Mm -hmm. And that policy really will do nothing more than draw a line on the map. Mm -hmm. Down to Georgia, beginning from Georgia, going according to the headwaters, the edge of the mountains, all the way north, uh, up through New York, twisting through New England, and then all the territory on the left side, that is the Midwestern and Southern Western side of that line, will be declared territory for the Indians forever. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, that's the policy, if I could put right. it that way, uh, and that was that was what that was what came out of this. One of the most important developments out of the whole uh, French and Indian War period. Right. I, I, I wonder, Jim, did the Oneida play any role in Pontiac's uprising? Not really. What? The, or the, the I am neutral aware. on the side it, of England. Yeah, let me, it's it is a it is a, a side story somewhat. But it goes to the uh, uh, Six Nations have claimed uh, northern Pennsylvania all the way down through the Wyoming Valley area yeah. of uh, north. That would be more northeastern Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, and they sort of have taken it over from the Susquehannocks and they've sort of overrun mm -hmm. the Delawares. Yeah. And they've turned the Delawares into, you know, kind of they're, they are the sovereign of the Delawares. And the, the point about that is that they are concerned about protecting that territory during the Seven Years' War. And also, they are not, as best of my recollection, not that active in the fighting that would be involved because they're really more interested in protecting territory right. rather than getting into engagement and uh, that would perhaps threaten their control of that territory. Yeah, that certainly seems to be in line with their previous, you know, policy between the right. English and the right. French, wanting to right. protect what was theirs. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, so we've mentioned some of the characters, William, Sir William Johnson and Molly Brandt and Joseph Brandt. I wonder if we could say, are, are there any others um, you'd like to just tell us about either oh, yes. Or, or Yes, because I haven't even talked about some of the key mm -hmm. Oneida characters. Um, and... I have, I have two or three or four that I would like okay. to uh, mention. Uh, one of them is an Indian by the name of Skenandoa. Mm -hmm. uh, and he will live, from the best we can tell, for 110 years. Wow. And he's a major leader in the United Nation. And the reason I mention him is that he's involved in all this fighting that's going on. Uh, and he will end up being on the pro-American, that is, the anti-British side. Mm -hmm. Well, we can ask why, and I don't mean to oversimplify here because it is a, a bit of a complex story. But he is greatly influenced by a Presbyterian minister by the name of Samuel Kirkland, and Kirkland is going to become the leader or the Christian leader that will get along very, very well with the Oneida people, not all of them. Mm -hmm. but the warriors, in many ways, like Skenandoa, were very attracted to uh, the faith uh, that uh, Kirkland is bringing them. So Samuel Kirkland is a major. Now, one one time I, I visited uh, uh, the Hamilton College campus, uh, and they're in their graveyard, buried together. That is in two separate graves, but next to each other. One, Samuel Kirkland, who was one of the founders of that college, and then Skenadoa, right next wow. to him. Wow. I mean, that is a symbol of the friendship they had and the mm -hmm. influence. Because if we call Johnson, Sir William, a cultural broker, that's the same thing we should say about uh, Samuel Kirkland. And he lives in one of the villages, also where uh, Skenadoa is, uh, called, and I, I try to say it right, but... It's kind of Wallahail, and it's it's near Lake Oneida, if you have familiarity with, uh, let's say it's not too far from Syracuse and Utica, but closer to the lake. And they live together. This is a principal Oneida village, and Kirkland lives with them. Hmm. And it, it's, it's incredible, the bond there, because Kirkland, one of the things that he does and some of the local Indians don't like this. He says, 
get the alcohol out of here mm -hmm. because you start fighting among yourselves. You've been known to kill one another. That just causes further problems. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Skenandoah had become an alcoholic. Wow. And that was part of the appeal of, of Kirkland to Skenandoah because he helped uh, him with his alcohol problem. And at a certain point, Skenandoah quit drinking. And for the mm -hmm. last 40 or 50 years of his, life, wow. of his life, he never had another drink. That's the kind of bond. So that also goes to the point that we were talking about. It's not Europeans on one side, white Europeans yeah. and Indians on the other. This goes back to the texture of uh, contact that mm -hmm. David Preston talks about. These people can live and work together. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have Indian, Indians in the some of the United Territory uh, that are renting land to white settlers coming from Germany, the Palatines. Mm -hmm. So they are actually... It's, it's amazing because we don't really talk about this side of the story. Yeah. Maybe we've spent too much time with the Hollywood versions, if I can yeah. put it that way. But another example is a man that uh, I've gotten to know, what I see very well, a man by the name of Haneri Dockstater. I can't pronounce his name, the, the uh, actual Indian name that he has. But he's a combination, uh, a Palatine father, a Mohawk mother, mm -hmm. He will ultimately join with uh, and will become an Oneida, one of their great warrior leaders, and will be involved in some of the combat that we might mm -hmm. go into uh, with respect to the American Revolution. He, too, is close with Kirkland. Mm -hmm. His wife, we, we know her as, I call her Tyona. Uh, mm -hmm. She has a much, you triple that, and that's her name, and I can't pronounce no. it, so I'm not going to try. No. She's also known as uh, uh, Two Kettles. Two kettles. Yes. In any way, and she's very important to the story, too. Uh, just as Molly Brandt is on the British yeah. side with uh, uh, mm -hmm. William Johnson, uh, she's very important on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're very, very tied to Kirkland. Kirkland is an enthusiast preaching, working mm -hmm. with the Continental Congress to convince. In fact, he makes mm -hmm. a trip at the behest of the Continental Congress wow. in 1775. Stay out of the war. Stay out of the war. But if you ever join, join us. Wow. That, wow. That's the way to put it. So these relationships are very, very important. And that's the key, from my point of view, to understanding the history of white or white Indian relations. That's the key, is that we have to get down to the people and mm -hmm. not deal in stereotypes such as skulking right. in the woods or, yeah. uh, you know, invasion or whatever those kinds of th words can lead to, uh, right. because that's where the real story is from my point of view. This is fascinating. Uh, we're going to have to have you come back on to talk about then the real story. I mean, we've given yeah. us a great background here and a lot to think about, but I think um, we can save a bit and, and we'll have you come back on to talk about what happens during the war, because that's a fascinating story, too. We've been Sounds good to, to me. Great, great. We've been talking with James Kirby Martin, Thank the Cullen Professor of History at the University of Houston Emeritus about his work on Forgotten Allies, the United Indians, and the American Revolution. I want to thank you, Jim, for joining us. This has been great. And I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, our man behind the curtain, and all of our many listeners. You know, Jim, when we started these podcasts, and you have been on before. We thought we'd have a handful of folks in and around Boston, but we have folks all over the world tuning in regularly. And I want to thank this week our friends in Edinburgh and in Barretos, which is in Sao Paulo in Brazil, in Princeville, Hawaii, and in Utica, New York, where folks are tuning in to listen. And I look forward to talking with you again. And uh, now we will be piped out on the road to Boston.